From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on this Thursday, December 9th. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. Is it work from home or Davos? The World Economic Forum is set for Switzerland in January, even though Omicron is forcing more companies to revert to back to work from home. And J&J management shakeup. The company overhauling its executive team before spring, uh, before spinning off its consumer unit. We're going to have an exclusive interview with the outgoing CEO, Alex Gorski. And the dollar in demand, you got equities rolling over, investors opting for bonds in the dollar. Do you buy into this dollar dominance ahead of tomorrow's CPI? From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host for today, Danny Berger in London. Guy Johnson's on assignment. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. So, Danny, you setting up your camera at home? <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to go back to work from home life. I cannot handle that again. But, you know, the way things are headed it doesn't look like we're too far away from that in the UK. Boris Johnson telling everyone yesterday, stay home if you can. Yeah, and he's raised all the questions, too. Like, do we need to be worried again about economic growth? Would that be inflationary? What would that act? Would you get mm. more government support? It raises all those kind of questions. It does. And you can see that play out in these equity markets. Not only is there not a lot of convi conviction in them, but the latest Bloomberg survey of year-end 2022 targets, the second biggest gap in terms of where people expect yeah. us to go in 10 years. People just don't know direction-wise where we're headed. Yep, which equals volatility. Fun stuff. All right, well, yep. uh, stay with Bloomberg because all day tomorrow, Guy Johnson is going to be live on location from the GXO Nestle Distribution Center. It's about supply chains, but it's also making sure that you get your Christmas presents on time. And how do you do that? We'll be looking mm -hmm. at some robots, really cool automation. So definitely stay with us uh, as well. All right, as we're talking about, you got equities retreating after a three-day rally. You have uh, airlines, travel stocks giving up some gains. The dollar, though, reigning strong. Yields also pushing lower. Do you buy the dollar's dominance? That's our question of the morning. Bloomberg's Vincent Signorella, former trader and voice of the global uh, audio squawk, and Bloomberg's Michael McKee, uh, join us now. Hey, guys, thanks for joining. Uh, Vincent, do you buy the dollar dominance? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I've been buying the dollar for five years, and I don't see a reason why we should stop. There are two... There are two arguments going forward. One, the uh, the virus dissipates and everyone goes back to work and we have a big global growth story and that puts the Fed on a faster trajectory course to raise rates, positive for the dollar. I think the Fed will then be in the same place as the Bank of Canada on the same trajectory. So two good currencies to keep an eye on. The second is the virus dominates, things shut down again and you buy the dollar in a haven trade. So I don't see a reason to sell it. Michael, let me bring you in on that first part about what Vincent was talking about, and that's a more hawkish Fed. How much of a divergence are we starting to see between Fed and other central banks? Well, if you leave out some of the emerging markets that have been raising rates because they're trying to tamp down on inflation ahead of the Fed, uh, you're looking at some divergence among the, uh, a small amount of divergence among the majors except for the Bank of Japan. Now, next week's going to be critical because all three are meeting the Bank of England, the ECB, and the Fed. And the Fed's the only one really at this point that uh, people are worried about uh, because they're starting to think the Fed is going to be raising rates, getting to Vince's point, and I totally agree with him about the dollar on that. Uh, the Bank of England is a question mark. Uh, are they going to wait now with the lockdowns and then see what happens to the economy and the ECB behind everybody else? So, uh, you know, the, the situation really isn't going to change a whole lot for quite some time uh, into 2022, and that'll put pressure on the dollar. Does the CPI change the, the, the trajectory of the dollar tomorrow, Mike? I don't think so. I think the trajectory is pretty much established. Uh, it's going to be related to two things. Uh, one is how fast people think that the Fed is going to be raising rates. And two, uh, as Vince mentioned, commodity prices, uh, where are they going? Uh, those are going to tell us something about what the dollar will do. But at this point, it looks like uh, the market is pretty much priced in into the dollar and other assets. Uh, the Fed moving more quickly. The only question is exactly when. Vince, Mike was also mentioning the BOE there. To what degree have rate hikes no longer happening next week? To what degree has that already been priced into assets? I think for the Bank of England, you, you have to see them on hold for a while. We've just seen uh, CNBC reporting that, that um, 
the, the uh, UK Health Security Agency said that they could likely see one million cases of the uh, new strain by the end of the month, and that doesn't even count in the gatherings we're going to see for the holidays and, and for the new year. So I think the, the UK is, is – the Bank of England is in a really difficult place. They have inflation. They're going to see imported inflation, and yet at the same time, they could see the economy slowing down a little bit. And you're not going to say stagflation per se, but – borderline, and, and that leaves them in a tough spot. So I think a little bit behind the eight ball, they're going to have to raise rates eventually, but I think they're going to have to let the, vari the variant and the economy play out first, and they're going to be very much in a catch-up situation. Uh, let me jump in and ask Vince a question about this, because you're the expert on it. Uh, when you look at what is happening in terms of growth and inflation in China and the valuation of the UN, are we likely to see, do you think from uh, your point of view, a rate cut and how does that affect the global balance of uh, uh, currency values? That's a really, really good question. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure we'll see a rate cut in China, but I think we'll see them continue to, to manipulate the, the reserve requirements as they did uh, last night. Uh, and they'll continue to, uh, they do continue to manipulate the currency. Um, the, clearly, uh, last night, by the weakening of the, of the fix, uh, they put a, put a foot in the ground and basically said, you're moving it too fast, too far. And that's always been a big issue with China. They're OK with the currency appreciating as long as it's on a very, very slow managed uh, pace. And that's pretty much the same for uh, most central banks. So I, I think we're going to continue to see them manage it. They've got a really difficult situation with their with their real estate market and their developed market. They've let that get out of hand. And so it, uh, a cut in interest rates possibly fuels a bigger problem for them in the housing sector. So they're walking on, you know, tinder hooks as well. Yeah, and I'm also wondering what you, like, let the market sort it out. Like, I'm kind of wondering what that actually means and what that looks like uh, over in China. Um, so, Danny, what I also find really interesting, too, uh, is wrapping in the ECB here, because we had mm. a report out that says that maybe they're going to use some of the flexibility from PEP into the APP purchases. And we've kind of been expecting that, as PEP is said, to wind down in March. I'm just kind of interested in how traders are kind of betting on the equity market in relation to that in Europe. I, I keep hearing, like, now's the time. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, for one, we certainly see it play out in currencies, which I'm sure Vince knows really well. We're looking at a euro that's weaker by four-tenths of a percent versus the dollar. We are looking at weaker equity markets in uh, Europe as well. Vince, I mean, how, to what degree is this just, okay, it's a global phenomenon, we're kind of worried about the economy, or what is it very Europe-specific about looking at PEP flexibility that perhaps is, is creating some of the dour mood in, in both the FX and equity space? Well, I, I think what investors are looking at is the ECB sort of uh, a telling a tale, if you will. They really want to cut monetary stimulus, but they're really not in a position to do so. You look at what's going on in the economy in Germany and the virus spread in, in Germany and how it's now uh, plaguing Europe. Uh, and, you know, we're going to see it here. The, 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 you know, the labor secretary yesterday saying we need to get people back to work. I'm not sure what data he's looking at, but clearly what happens in Europe comes here within four to six weeks, uh, yes. and we're going to get hit with it. And that's going to support the euro a little bit because we're going to be behind and we're going to catch up. I wouldn't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but Europe is in mm. a precarious situation, and I don't think they're in a position to back off monetary stimulus anytime soon. Vincent, I'm so glad you said that because I feel like I've been saying that for the last few weeks, that we're usually four to six weeks behind. So the fact that we may be immune to all this seems a little absurd. So, Mike, to that point, I'm just wondering how far ahead the Fed can run. <laughs> well, the Fed is going to worry about itself first in the United States. And so if we see these kind of ongoing inflation pressures lasting until, say, March or April with no sign that they start to back off, then you're going to see the Fed start to react because the markets are going to react. And they're going to pull forward mm -hmm. the idea of rate increases. And the Fed is going to have to probably ratify that. If we see some drop off in inflation, the Fed will use that as an excuse to go as slow as possible. So uh, we've got three or four months before we actually know what's going to be happening here. My time frame a little longer than your four to six weeks. But Mike, at the same time, we continue to see the yield curve flatten. Can we interpret that maybe somewhat in the light of what Alex is saying that if we're going to move forward here, there are still risks out there in the economy that perhaps the market is pricing in a policy mistake? 
Well, that's what a lot of people will tell you. The issue is, or, or the question is, we, we've never been in this situation before, so we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And I think Vince started the whole conversation by talking about, well, we could have the virus accelerate or we could have the virus fall back, and that's going to have two different outcomes in terms of the economy. And it looks like at this point, the uh, market is sort of pricing that the virus is going to fall back. But if we have a problem, then again, you get that haven trade and we uh, start to see changes in the dollar as well. Exactly. I'm, I'm still really skeptical that Davos, for example, is going to happen in like a month. Um in person. Hey, uh, Vincent, before we let everybody go here, let's get back uh, to the question of the morning, which is, do you buy the dollar dominance? And you said yes. Against what? What has the most to decline against the dollar? I think the emerging market currencies uh, are probably the ones that are in the most trouble uh, for two reasons. Uh, a lot of their debt is based in dollars. And so as the dollar goes up, their, their budgets get uh, thrown out of whack. Um, and the other is uh, my, my favorite to sell Sorry, Danny is the, is cable. Uh, not a fan of <laughs> not a fan of sterling even a little bit. Uh, as so many things going against it, both on the on the negative inflation front, the Brexit story, the Northern Ireland issue is still not resolved, and 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 that's I guess my one of my least favorites in, in terms of G10. By the way, as we as we started this conversation, the dollar popped significantly, so somebody's paying attention. <laughs> Shameless plug. Uh, also, let's not forget that over in the UK, we're having businesses talk about we need more support now with work from home. Um, yeah. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Fun roundtable. Vincent Signorella of Bloomberg and Michael McKee as well. And we'll answer this question throughout the next couple hours, so stick with us. Uh, right after this, though, we have an exclusive interview with Alex Gorski, Johnson & Johnson chairman and CEO. That's coming up next. Don't miss it. This is Bloomberg. For Bloomberg Television and Radio Worldwide, I'm David Weston. We're joined now by the chairman and CEO of Johnson & Johnson, Alex Gorski. Alex, thank you so much for having us up to your headquarters here. Uh, the big issue, I think, in the globe, it's not an exaggeration, is COVID and now its most recent permutation, Omicron. Give us a sense of Johnson & Johnson's position in that strategic battle. Yeah, well, David, first of all, welcome here to Johnson & Johnson. And, and you're right. I mean, and, and first of all, I think it's important to just acknowledge the great progress that we've seen. And clearly, we still have some big challenges in front of us. But if you think back to the uncertainty that all of us around the world, let alone here in the U.S., faced 20 months ago around would we have a vaccine, would we have therapeutics, what was going to be the path forward, we certainly have made a lot of progress. But I think what Omicron has demonstrated is that, look, we need to get everybody vaccinated. The sooner we can get everybody vaccinated, the sooner, and, and that, you know, more and more we're learning includes a booster, uh, the sooner that we're going to be able to prevent these additional mutations and, uh, and hopefully get through it. And, uh, and look, we remain absolutely committed to this. Uh, in, in fact, we're working real time as we speak, not only on our current version of the vaccine to get it out to as many people in the world as possible, but also on a next generation, depending on what we find out about Omicron. And, and we believe it's still gonna take a collective effort of many companies, many countries, and frankly, the world taking this on. So what do you know at this point, because it's early going, about the effectiveness of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine against the Omicron variant? Well, we still have a lot to learn. And uh, what I would say overall is that you know, we, we need to perform some additional testing. We know that this virus likely it transmits at a much faster rate, and that's not good. Uh, and number two, we're still trying to understand what it means in terms of the severity of the disease. Um, you know, we're encouraged by some of the other data that we've seen uh, thus far regarding how the current vaccines, particularly when boosted, uh, are, are reacting against this virus. But look, we've got to gather more data from testing in the clinic, from real world evidence. We'll know a lot more in the coming weeks, uh, but we're encouraged by what we've seen thus far. Do you have any sense of timeline when you might have some, um, some better read on how for specifically the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will work against Omicron? We should know in the coming weeks uh, and, and have a much better indication of exactly how ours works uh, against this particular variant. There's a lot of talk about maybe a next generation of vaccines specifically tailored for Omicron. Other vaccine makers are talking about that. It's a different technology Johnson & Johnson has. It's not the mRNA technology. Can you tailor make, can you change your vaccine to address Omicron if necessary? The short answer is yes. Uh, and we're working on that as we speak. But of course, where we want to start is to see 
how will the Omicron virus uh, be impacted by the current vaccine? And look, uh, again, we're encouraged by some of the data. We need to gather more to, to determine exactly, you know, what the efficacy profile will look like. Uh, but right now, in fact, we're already working on a next generation, should that be necessary. One of the things that I've learned, I did not know before, is there's a different profile for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as opposed to the others. And yep. that is, it doesn't raise the antibodies of the protection as much in the early stages, but it may last longer. What do you know about the duration of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Well, from the very beginning, we tried to discover, design, and develop this vaccine uh, to really have strong durability over a long period of time. And you're exactly right. Your body tends to have two responses, at least two responses. There's one, there's the antibody response, which think of it as like the first line of defense that your body musters to take on this kind of a virus. And then you have what's called T cell and B cell, which are the longer term. That's what really gives your body the memory so that it can respond many years later that you see with other vaccines. And some of the data uh, that we've been able to pull together thus far does reflect that we have a very strong T cell and B cell response. And we're, we're studying that right now to say exactly how does that manifest itself in terms of durability and patency over time. Uh, because one thing we know for sure that this virus isn't going to go away tomorrow. So it's not only important that you have a strong response immediately, but that four, six, eight, 12 months later, particularly in some of these other areas around the world, uh, where the logistics of getting multiple doses is going to be really challenged. Those of us in the United States sometimes focus on the United States, and of course this is a global pandemic, it's not the United States. Give us a sense of the Johnson & Johnson role in fighting the pandemic in the rest of the world. What is your position as opposed to the other vaccines in, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa? Well, as I said earlier, you know, we knew from the very beginning that we were not going to truly have an impact uh, with our vaccine on this pandemic unless we took a global approach. So whether we looked at the way that we tried to design it, the way that we tested it on a very global level, even the way that we're manufacturing, you know, right now we have about 10 different locations, mm -hmm. not only here in the United States, but in South Africa and in India in Europe. Uh, and in the overwhelming majority of our vaccines up to this point in time have, have really uh, been used in the developing part of the world. So we are very committed to making that possible. I think what, certainly something that we've learned over the last few weeks with Omicron is that, you know, unless we can get people around the world vaccinated, unfortunately, this virus can continue to mutate, can continue to adapt itself and present a danger for the rest of the world. So you just made an interesting point I'm not sure I was aware of. If you take the total number of doses that have been administered thus far of Johnson & Johnson and compare the United States versus the rest of the world, what's the ratio? Oh, it's significant. I don't have the exact ratio, but it's multiples more have been used in the developing part of the world versus the developed world. What about mRNA? Uh, is that something that you're interested in? Is it something, given our experience with this, you think maybe Johnson & Johnson should be taking a closer look at? Well, I think mRNA is a very exciting technology. And in fact, we are working at it uh, in a number of different areas. And, um, and again, I think that, you know, being in a position now uh, based upon the research that the industry has done to have mRNA approaches, to have adenovirus approaches, to have multiple options, again, is just a reflection of how much the science has evolved. And it really a better positions all of us to be better prepared for the future. Uh, and, and we think, again, having multiple approaches will be the best way to go. Uh, of course, your tenure is coming up at Johnson & Johnson, but on, before you leave, people have said at Johnson & Johnson, there are several deals being considered un active, under active consideration. Uh, might those involve mRNA? Do you need to make acquisitions to really move into that science? Well, look, I, I can't share with you, of course, all the details of that. But one thing that I'm really proud of, uh, particularly over the last 10 years, if you look at our track record of innovation at Johnson & Johnson, about 50% of the time we tend to source it externally. Because we know that we're never going to discover and develop everything within our own laboratories. Uh, and, and frankly, being a good partner, being able to work with scientists, whether it's at an academic center or a startup company, places around the world, is critical to success. You know, ultimately, we want to have the best solution. And we're agnostic, whether it's developed in-house or, you know, uh, externally. And, um, and I think is reflected in our track record. And in fact, I think over the last five years, we've invested about $55 billion internally. And we've invested about that same amount externally to really try to source the best science that we can for patients around the world. How has the pandemic changed the business of Johnson & Johnson as you look forward? Uh, will vac vaccines be a much larger portion of your, uh, of your business? Well, I think in several ways. One, 
we do think vaccines can be applied in so many areas. I mean, think about it for a moment. If we can take some of these technologies and apply vaccines to perhaps areas in cancer, perhaps in neuroscience and areas like Alzheimer's, so that we can actually prevent disease from happening in the first place, what a great achievement that will be. You know, all too often in these other diseases, we get to things too late in the course of the disease. So if we can, if we can engage and interact earlier to prevent that cascade from happening, we're going to be in a much better position. So yes, we're studying vaccines in a number of different areas. Two, I think the understanding and appreciation, whether it's mRNA, whether it's new cell-based therapies, or how can we actually think of it as changing the software in, in the cells, our understanding of that, the regulatory process, uh, I think has been greatly accelerated during this pandemic period. And it's certainly my hope that we can use that to parlay the, into other areas. And, and last but not least, David, just the way that we've been able to partner with regulators, with governments, with other companies, you know, the more we can share knowledge like that, accelerate some of these development timelines, the better it's going to be for patients. Alex, as you say, Johnson Johnson has long been known for making substantial investments in science. Is that going to be even larger? Even today, you've announced some changes, some leadership changes coming up. You have a long-term uh, chief scientific officer stepping down. You're going to replace him with not one, but two people. That's right. Well, look, this year at Johnson & Johnson, we'll invest you know, just about $14 billion in research and development. That puts us among, I believe, the, the top five companies in the United States, the top 10 companies in the world. And we think that's essential for us to keep that rate and pace of innovation going. And you're right, we, you know, Dr. Paul Stoffels, after, you know, more than 25 years at Johnson & Johnson, an incredible career, not only in what he's done here, but for global public health, helping people around the world, decided to retire. Uh, but the good news is we've got a tremendous and deep, bench of, of leaders to replace them, people like Dr. Bill Haidt, Dr. Matai Maman, and uh, those two leaders will be added to our executive committee and I think even increase uh, the voice of science among our senior leadership team. An important part of your legacy will be the dividing of the company, something a lot of people never thought they'd see. Did the pandemic really trigger that? No, look, uh, this has been part of an ongoing discussion that we've had with our board of directors. Uh, I mean, annually we would talk about our portfolio, our diversified approach. And uh, while we've always been proud of the heritage of our three different sectors and how we took it, we also realized that, you know, look, as dynamics change, as markets change, as science changes, as expectations change, that uh, we need to evolve with it. Uh, we're excited about this announcement. We think it's going to unlock great potential in our consumer brands. Uh, and, and for Johnson & Johnson, for our pharmaceutical business or medical device business going forward. One last one, Alex, because this is toward the end of your tenure. What are you proudest of? You know, David, I, th I think what I'm most proud of is just to, to reflect on the number of patients and consumers. You know, we estimate that we touch more than a billion every day. Uh, and uh, to know that we've been able to hopefully help people live longer, healthier, happier, and better lives, um, that's really important. Alex Gorski, Chairman and CEO of John Sanchez, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. And best of luck to you. And back to you. That was Alex Gorski, a J and J CEO on Bloomberg's David Weston. Thank you so very much, uh, Danny. What I thought was interesting is earlier the WHO says you kind of got to give people the same shot if you're going to do two doses, mm. unless you don't have the supply. And so I wonder how the interaction though will be between the traditional vaccines like a J&J &J and the mRNA vaccine. There is data that shows mm. potentially that they mix well together, and I think the future of how all this develops when it comes to COVID will be quite interesting. Yeah, uh, one of the issues, though, not to kind of be the doomsdayer, but by the time we figure this out, how rampant is Omicron going to be? Tyler Cohen, mm. Bloomberg opinion columnist, writing that some estimates are that we might peak in January by or February. It's unlikely we'll know the answers to these questions by that point. Yeah, it's a good point. Also, you see the mRNA guys saying probably by March 2022, we'll get a specific right. Omicron a vaccine, the traditional vaccines are going to take a little bit longer potentially to do that, um, which mm. brings us to like the big take story for Bloomberg, which is will there ever be kind of one vaccine to rule them all at the end of the day?
Yeah, and look, it's something that the UK is certainly grappling with when it comes to the big investment they put in AstraZeneca. Yeah. This was also touted as something that we could give to developing countries as well. Does the UK then need to kind of have a mea culpa that it didn't make sense to really put all the eggs in that basket? Oh, I can't imagine Boris Johnson ever saying that. Okay, uh, no. <laughs> well, coming up, we have a lot more for you. It's our question of the day. Do you bind the dollar dominance, particularly head of CPI tomorrow? Mark McCormick, TD Securities, global head of FX strategy, will be joining us next. This is Blue. Bloomberg. Live from New York, I'm Alex Steele with Danny Berger over in London. Guy Johnson is on assignment today. This is Bloomberg Markets. We are one hour into the U.S. trading session. Equities trading a little bit heavy here. Bloomberg's Priti Gupta has some of those movers for you. Kriti? Yeah, let's start off with just the broad sentiment right now because the stock market is actually lower on the day. This falls, of course, three days of gains. No surprise here, a little bit of a pullback. Remember, we had a 4% pullback last week, really led by that Black Friday sell-off, and now a 3% gain. So it's natural to let some of that steam out. And that's the sentiment that's shared across assets. So you see NY crude, or New York crude, I should say, down 0.8% right now. So once again, a little bit of a risk-off mode across asset classes. But Apple is really the one I want to keep an eye on because it has had a fast and furious three-day rally, but starting to take a little bit of a beat after nearing that $3 trillion mark. And I want to show you a chart here in my terminal that shows you what happens when Apple tends to hit that $1 trillion, $2 trillion market cap. You start to see a little bit of a pullback, a 40% drop since it hit that $1 trillion market cap, a 20% drop when it hit $2 trillion. So one of the concerns for investors here is that if it does hit $3 trillion, do you start to see a big sell-off? And that's going to be a problem for the S&P 500 too, because it's been leading the S&P 500 higher. So does that reflect in the macro view. Let me show you, though, some of those intraday movers because Boeing, American Airlines, losing some of its steam today. This coming after American Airlines trims some of its international flights, saying that Boeing's delays on the 787 Dreamliners, well, they're not doing great things for American Airlines right now. So you can see those stocks are selling off the market. Boeing weighing the Dow Jones Industrial Average lower. RH is one of the sole performers in the green today, actually coming out with blockbuster earnings, big revenue, be big earnings surprise to the upside, saying the supply chain issues, well, they're not hitting our bottom line as aggressively as we thought they would. Rent the Runway, though, also down quite a bit. Another earnings story that isn't looking good. I want to end here with a look ahead to tomorrow, which, of course, is that CPI data. We are getting going to get that inflation numbers. And 10-year yields have been ticking higher a little bit, but taking a little bit of a breather lately when you start to see that expectation of growth uh, concerns over in Europe. A lot of that has to do with those COVID lockdowns. Let's see, how, though, if that inflation report from tomorrow changes the picture for those 10-year yields. Great. Thanks so much. Great roundup there. And I have to say the team today just told me what an RH cloud couch is, and I I don't get it at all. I, well, I don't want an couch. Apparently, it's like you're couch. sitting on a cloud. Like, I mean, <laughs> which, which feels nice, although my daughter would jump on it okay. and break it, so there'd be that. I would also... Never leave the couch if that were the case. So I don't need that. I don't need that in my life. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, Alex Critty was talking about some of the, the strengths and the movement and yields there. And we're also looking at the dollar this morning holding on to its gains. Let's dig into the currency story more. Joining us now is Mark McCormick, TD Securities Global Head of FX Strategy. Mark, thanks so much for joining us this morning. You see the dollar continue to strengthen. It's the question Alex and I are asking today. Do you buy into the dollar dominance? Yeah, I think you definitely have to buy into the strength of the dollar in the short term. And you have to think about what's driving it and kind of unpack that a little bit. And a big part of it, as you just mentioned, is risk appetite. So risk appetite is faltering. We're seeing volatility across macro indicators, whether related to fixed income, equities, FX, or all at relatively high, higher levels than we've seen in 2021. But at the same time, we don't have the Fed put anymore. So essentially, the Fed has become more hawkish in an environment where there's growing geopolitical and, and growth uncertainty. So in that environment, uh, you know, the, the play here is really it's back to safe havens. It's a stronger dollar. And I think that's going to carry us into 2022, particularly because the Fed is going to ramp up the, the pace of tapering in the very short run. Hey, Mark, can we see higher equities in the U.S. and a higher dollar? Yeah, I think we can. There's an element here that it fits that U.S. exceptionalism theme. I don't think that's exactly what's in play, because if you track, uh, you know, slower moving growth indicators, the U.S. has had the biggest trouble with growth concerns throughout the uh, midpoint of 2021. So there's an element here that the U.S. is slowing much faster than other countries, although the data has been very positive in the very short run. 
But there's also an element here that what's happening is that the rest of the world is still dealing with, you know, COVID lockdowns, reopening struggles. And what we've seen is U.S. equities have outperformed rest of world equities, again, by a pretty hefty margin, almost 14% uh, throughout 2021. So there's a handover here, again, where tighter Fed, uh, you know, relatively slow ECB, and then other central banks around the world dealing with other themes. There's an element here that U.S. dollar does do well when U.S. equities are outperforming along with the hawkish Fed. Well, you mentioned that one of the plays here is one for a bid for havens. I wonder if that, that also extends to the yen, or do the, does that dollar dominance also mean that a yen out can't outperform in this environment? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, the way you want to think about it is real yields, yields moving higher. I think in an environment, whether it's stagflation or reflation, right, we still need higher yields. If, if it's reflation and global growth recovers, which is what we're expecting in the first half of the year, the yen's going to weaken because there's still going to be persistent outflows uh, from Japan to the rest of the world. And if it's stagflation, then we run into a little bit of a concern. But initially, the knee jerk is, is yields are going to move higher because central banks are going to have to uh, essentially uh, quell the inflationary pressures. But the fact that in an environment where the global economy slips and we start talking about deflation, then the yen will start to strengthen in 2022. We think we'll be somewhere in the sweet spot. But the immediate move here is that if risk is stumbling and we're seeing a shift back towards safe havens, uh, the yen would be relatively upbeat in that environment, though I do think we're getting to levels for dollar yen, you know, 111, 112, where you want to where you want to re-engage and buy the dollar against the yen on the, the relative divergence play. Hey, Mark, I'm seeing call after call that's looking for below 110 for euro dollar uh, for next year. What camp are you going to be in as we see the central, uh, central bank divergence pretty much? Yeah, I think it depends on which part of the year we're talking about. It's, it's, it's very clear that we're at least probably moving towards 110 in the front half of the year. I still think in the back half of the year, we're still probably talking 115, 118, largely because what we're seeing is it's kind of like first move in and then the last movers are, are, are underperforming. So there's an element here that what's happened over the last six weeks um, in terms of the, the variant, the uncertainty, the global growth, the volatility, uh, the fact that we are now seeing very clear divergence between the Fed and the ECB, that will push euro probably towards 110, even below, probably in the front part of early next year, which is the carryover. Uh, the, the rub here is essentially that once we get the Fed priced in, we know that the terminal rate in the U.S. is not extremely high. It's, it's Markets are pricing at around 150, maybe 1.75 percent, and we're already there for 2024. Hmm. So there's an element in the back half of the year. The global economy starts to recover. The supply chain issues are mitigated. You know, we have cyclical and structural inflation. I would say there are cyclical drivers of inflation that are going to drop next year. So next year, we're not going to be talking about accelerating inflation around the world. So there's an element here that the ECB comes into the play. Global economy still doing OK. We've priced in the Fed cycle. And that's where the euro starts to bottom out. It's, it's probably a question of around whether it's hmm. Q2 or early Q3. But that is where I think we're headed uh, for 2022. Well, if we have central bank divergence at this moment, at this moment now, one of the banks that stands out that's newly joining that divergence story is the BOE. It was not long ago we were talking about the BOE leading the Fed in terms of tightening policy. What is this about shift, this about face from the markets? What are the consequences of that in terms of looking at how these assets are priced? Yeah, it's a great question because they have kind of differing characteristics. Like the U.S. can run a current account deficit. And as we talked about, equity flows are very ample. And you're seeing the broad balance of payments supported in the U.S. because people are buying the equity story. There's foreign investment coming into the U.S. The U.K., on the other hand, runs a large current account deficit. And it requires the kindness of strangers to fund that deficit. And so that's another way of saying is that the fact that we were pricing in a very hawkish Bank of England just two months ago, that gave uh, cable the rate cushion it needed to be insulated from some of the shocks that are going on around the world, mm -hmm. particularly a very poor inflation and growth mix for the UK in 2022. The fact that they have already kind of moved off of, you know, the 2021 rate hike, and now it seems like we're already moving into, you know, jeopardizing the story for 2022 and how many hikes we're going to get. The concern is, is there's no longer the rate cushion or the stability of the carry that you would get from owning UK-based fixed income products. So there's an element here that no one wants to buy UK stocks, but there was, uh, you know, you could cushion the deficit and, the, you know, the lack of funding flows through higher interest rates. That being questioned has now put, you know, Sterling in a camp where, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty around it, and it correlates very well with risk appetite. So, you know, the next move here is if we don't get a rate hike next week, it's very likely we'll probably retest 130 because we've lost that rate cushion now. 
um, mm -hmm. and also the carry story that comes with it. Which kind of even boosts even more that dollar dominance story there. Hey, Mark, uh, thanks a lot, Mark McCormick at TD Security. Stay with us because we want to break down uh, Evergrande's default next. The market seems relatively calm, but this comes as days after the U.N. Uh, hit its highest level since 2018. We'll break it all down for you. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Ritika Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Kathy Wood, the ARK Investment Management CEO. That's at 2 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Ritika Gupta. A new study is likely to confirm fears about the contagiousness of the Omicron variant. It warns that Omicron is four times more transmissible in its early stages than Delta. A Japanese scientist analyzed data from South Africa, the epicenter of the outbreak. He found that Omicron transmits more and escapes immunity. Jobless claims in the U.S. have fallen to a 52-year low. That's seen as illustrating the difficulties adjusting the raw data for seasonal effects. Initial applications for unemployment benefits totaled 184,000 last week. That's well below estimates. And for the first time, Chinese developer Evergrande has defaulted on dollar debt. Fitch cut the company's rating to restricted default after it missed dollar bond interest payments. We asked Hong Kong's top regulator about the impact. It's a significant event. I mean, you can't, you can't possibly underplay it, but it's basically, it, it's not that category of event for the financial system. You believe, it's, you believe it's ring fenced? Yes. Evergrande has about $300 billion worth of debt. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg, Alex. All right, thank you so much, Ritika. And it feels like the market took that Evergrande news uh, very much in stride. Let's break that down a little bit more. Damien Sassauer, Bloomberg Intelligence Chief Emerging Market Credit Strategist, uh, joins us now. And Mark McCormick of TD Securities uh, still with us. So I was going to go with Evergrande, but then they had this really great conversation in the middle of the commercial break about what the trade is with the UN. And we just saw the PBOC come in uh, and raise the reserve requirement for foreign currency and that kind of tamped down uh, the UN rally because we've seen the highest level since 2018. Uh, Damien, what was your take on that? So look, I mean, Mark and I, what we were talking about, quite frankly, is the fact if you look at Euro Yuan, Euro Yuan is up 10.2 percent today. 10.2 uh, percent, I mean, meaning the renminbi is appreciated 10.2 percent relative to the euro. It's only up 2 percent relative to the dollar. That differential is huge, and that's what's causing people to make those comparisons between now and the shock devaluation, which we saw by the PBOC in 2015, right? I don't think we're there yet. Certainly, China yuan stability is very, very important to the PBOC, <clears throat> um, and they're going to do everything they can to maintain that. But certainly, what we saw overnight, allowing banks to hold more foreign currency reserves, you know, they're doing everything they can to try and weaken the yuan in the face of what's happening here. Of course, that triple R cut is going to go a long way to alleviating some stress on the property sector. But my goodness, we're only in the early stages of that in the lieu of the defaults by Evergrande and now Kaisa. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point, too, because Euro Yuan is your kind of global macro uh, COVID backdrop, which is all about capital flows. It's all about current account dynamics. And one of the things that's interesting is China has not been able to recycle all the excess flows coming into its country. So you have the trade surplus building up because manufacturing is booming because of, you know, the reopenings in one country versus the lack of demand in, or the lack of supply in another. And on the other side of it, there's all this equity inflow coming in. Yeah. So there's an element that the current account has risen, the broad balance of payments and surplus. And Europe has the opposite problem, which is they can't stop money from kind mm. of leaking out. There was a story where equity flows were coming back into the eurozone in early you know, 2021, but that's partly reversed. So a big part of this trade is if supply chains reconnect and if we see energy prices stabilize and we see some of the reopening around mobility and the dispersion of mobility start to ebb in the next three to six months, Euro China is trading on our valuation models at a th almost three standard deviation discount. So it's a slow moving trade, but huh. it is one of the most mispriced trades around the world that fits into this COVID mm -hmm. macro story that we're in. Yeah, hey Mark, I, I was going to ask exactly that. Do we want to take the opposite side of this trade, assuming that if you're looking for currency pairs that will start to reverse given a more normalized world? Is this really the one with the most room to run? I don't think it is. It's, you know, this is a, a partly a relative value trade, right? So I, I guess as we talked about in the first segment, like we're still partly in a dollar dominated driving world. Like it's risk appetite, it's global growth, it's Fed. It's the factors have, have kind of narrowed a bit.
But I do think that 2022 is going to be about fundamentals. It's about macro fundamentals. It's about which countries are reopening again. Who's, where are vaccines rising and, and reopening? Uh, it starts to kick in. Who offers more carry? Because central banks are moving in different directions. Where are terms of trade? Again, one of the most important stories around FX is the relative difference in commodities. The disruption that's happening in the commodity market is going to have a huge impact for, for currencies. And lastly, valuations uh, are also very different across currencies. So that will be a big driver. I just don't think we're going to be trading those themes in the next uh, six weeks. But that, I think, is going to be the key for 2022, which helps New Zealand and Norway in the G10, so, uh, in my view. So, Mark, if I'm hearing you correctly, we're talking about diverging markets, not emerging markets. And from that perspective, I mm. guess, you know, the question is, where do you want to go? Where do you want to position? I mean, are you going to look for this inflation theme? I mean, the focus on the reopening, on the inflation, uh, on the persistence of inflation. At what point does that shift to growth? I mean, we talk about transitory inflation, but a lot of this is transitory growth. Do you see that happening at any point in the first or second quarter of next year? Well, yeah, there's an element we have to kind of move out of the stagflation environment. Like we built a, a simple indicator that looks at the volatility of mobility, which we can measure every single day. So as we have more mobi mobility volatility, we use that as basically an anecdote that supply chain disruptions will continue and that, you know, we'll still have that cyclical volatility. Uh, I do think a big part of it is we have just thrown a monkey wrench into the growth story because of Omicron. And we're not sure how much uh, governments are going to respond to it. I think most people in the market assume that it's not going to have as much of an impact on Delta as Delta has. And if you even look at Google search trends, the search trends for Omicron um, have not had the same impact that they had at Delta. That, you know, that's one simple indicator to think about. But what most people are worried about is how governments respond to it. And so, you know, we're still dealing with a lot of uncertainty whether or not lockdowns are, are going to become more stringent and whether or not mobility has to aggressively decline. But what we're seeing on our global mobility tracker, we're still at three times the level higher now than when we were at this point last year. So I still think that there's still going to be above trend global growth next year, uh, but we're not sure when inflation is going to peak and moderate. Mm -hmm. It still could well, be in Q1. It still could be in Q2, which is you know still not going to get us into that growth mindset yet. Well, Damien, um, to pick up on that in terms of the reopening trade, even if Omicron is not something that we're all focused on as much as Mark was pointing out, what's the reopening trade in your world right now? Well, I mean, we were just talking about this. It's got to be Thai bot, right? Within Asia, I mean, Thailand has been the haven. It's been the place where you would go to go on vacation. It's the king of mobility. Unfortunately, we haven't seen tourist flows. We haven't seen travel come back. And the Thai bot has weakened off the back of that. And so, you know, I think if you're looking for a relative value play within emerging markets, Getting long Thai bot as things kind of subside as, as the market reopens relative to other Asian crosses is probably an area you want to be positioned in. Mark, before we let both of you go, I, I just have to ask, we've talked a lot of, about a lot of central bank decisions next week. We also have Turkey. The lira, is it a market you want to play in at all? Uh, in, my per, in my opinion, no. It's just there's too much uncertainty. There's too much in flux. There's no liquidity. Um, we're in a world right now, especially when you look at seasonality, we've also got this tracking of uh, G10 government bond liquidity. Government bond liquidity is at the worst position we've seen basically all year. This is probably an impact of tapering um, and also the fact that you know, just people don't want to warehouse risk um, in this environment. So, yeah, Turkey's really not the place to kind of take tactical decisions right now, in, in my opinion. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks All a right. lot. Appreciate yeah. it. Damien Sassar, Bloomberg Intelligence, and Mark McCormick of TD Securities. That was really fun. You said their conversation was awesome. Who talks faster? That's really the question next. All right, this <laughs> is Bloomberg. <laughs>
American Express and JP Morgan Chase for cardholders who have had at least a million dollars in the assets at the bank. B of A will offer them the chance to book private jets and drive exotic cars on NASCAR track. In Manhattan, apartment rents soared last month by the most on record. Median rent jumped 23% from a year earlier to almost $3,400. That's according to appraiser Miller Samuel and broker Douglas Elliman Real Estate. Still, the median rent is almost 4% below where it was two years ago. And that is your latest business flash, Alex. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. I'm wondering if the amenities come in on that because there's a ton of amenities out there in these new luxury buildings, and I wonder if uh, there's uh, like which buildings are those included in. Um, all right, so Danny, we have a sell-off here underway. We're still relatively calm, but here in the U.S., the Nasdaq is leading the declines. The Nasdaq 100 down by seven tenths of one percent. The S&P off by about four tenths of one percent. Yeah, we're off the lows of the session, uh, but some of the worst performers are Devon, Southwest, and Tesla. And the best performers are sort of the safety we mentioned, uh, CVS, as well as, as Twitter, uh, as well as Pfizer. Um, I'm also interested to see what's happening with the reopening trade because airlines and uh, casinos, etc., cruise lines, they've done really well when we've seen these monster rallies uh, and they're sort of rolling over uh, here. We're seeing buying coming in treasury market, big move in that. We have a dollar a dominant story as well. Those exact themes are really playing through in the European session as well, Alex. As you say, same with the U.S. We're off of the lows for this session. We're down about one-tenth of one percent. Energy, the worst performer. We're seeing some of that weakness in oil prices as well, really feeding into a lot of these regions that especially spells trouble for the FTSE 100. And that strong dollar, really what we've been talking about today, this policy divergence, including this Bloomberg Scoop ECB looking at reinvesting uh, some of those PEP funds and the dovishness really embedded in the euro just continues to bring this pair lower, we're looking at a decline of about half a percent for the euro. I've had my eye really on the entirety of the UK rate market because mm -hmm. we've seen those bets for the BOE to tighten next week completely taken off the table. We're looking at a more stalled BOE. We're looking at bond buying, uh, not just in the UK, I should say, really across uh, sovereign bonds in Europe, Alex. Yeah, and it's a great point because you take a look at the two years, say, in the UK versus here in the US. We're pretty much not moving here in the US, which really mm. goes home to your point of that central bank divergence. I'm wondering if it goes even farther, though, and break this down in the next hour. If you have the work from home mandate, do you have some uh, sectors that are going to need more government support? And are we going to be back mm. to that narrative when we've already, when it's been drained out of the economy? Do we have to go back to that now? Yeah, I have to say there have been a lot of calls in the UK to give that government support again with this call to work from home. So you're not the only one thinking that, Alex. All right, well, we're going to dig a lot in, uh, deeper into that in the next hour because coming up on the European close, uh, Kate Bingham is SV Health Investors Managing Partner. Uh, she's going to join us next. Uh, how do you finance vaccines? How do you get it out there? Also, do the measures that we're seeing in the UK, that plan B, is it actually going to work and make any kind of difference when it comes to Omicron? This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.